This is Pinky Tessa's A to Z of London. It's K for King's Road. There are 41 other thoroughfares of the same name in London, but this is the King's Road. It's the exceedingly famous one in Chelsea, SW3, and habitually associated with the swinging 60s. Probably known the world over. The KR, King's Road, do keep up is just under two miles long, running through the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, from Sloan Square, which heralds a tube station, to the junction of Waterford Road, where it suddenly becomes New King's Road, just for a hoot, Hepcat. And there isn't a tube station round here to be had for love nor money. How did it get its name then? Essentially because of its original function, that of a private road for the king, when he took his travels to Kew. The king in question was Charles II. He was the son of the cat who lost his head in 1649, man. The erstwhile kingdom was run as a commonwealth until the death of the Ollie Dude. The way out new monarchy was restored in 1660. Meanwhile, this private road belonging to the king remained private until 1830. Despite the private thing, people with connections to the area were able to use it. How kind of the morning. Some houses on the road today still date from the early 18th century, which which ones I couldn't tell you, man. Thomas Arne, who it is believed composed Royal Britannia, lived at 215 in 1740. There's a blue plaque commemorating Dame Ellen Terry. She lived in the same house from 1904 to 1920. She was the great aunt of the famous John Gilgood and the leading Shakespearean actress of her time. The world's first woman press photographer, Christina Broom, was born in 1862 at number eight, now engulfed in the premises called Peter Jones. The world's first glaciarium was a mechanically frozen ice rink moved into permanent venue at 379 Kings Road in 1876. The rink measured 40 by 24 feet. Ooh, huge! It wasn't until the mid-60s that the Kings Road hit the big time when it comes to the home of fashionable people. The inlock, the way out, the with it, the groovy, the hep. It really was all the rage, or so everyone says. But as always in the fashion states, it's usually a relatively small following, and on the whole, a young person's game. It was, however, the first time it wasn't the big established fashion houses that were setting the trends. One of the most famous of these retail outlets was Granny Takes a Trip, in the then unfashionable part of the road, opposite World's End Pub, at number 488. It opened in February 1966 by Nigel Weymouth and his girlfriend Sheila Cohen. I like the way she just becomes the girlfriend. Oh, and John Pierce, don't forget him. In 1969, it was acquired by Freddie Hornick and remained open until the mid-70s. It's gone down in history as London's first psychedelic boutique of the swinging 60s. The name Granny Takes a Trip has since been appropriated by all manner of clothing stores all over the world. I bet they wish they'd trademarked that little number. Hey ho. In July of 1968, the Chelsea Drug Store opened up. It was located on the northwest corner of Royal Avenue and Kings Road. It was a stylized, sleek, modern glass and aluminium fronted building. The concept was modeled on Le Drug Store in Paris on the Boulevard Saint Germain. Ooh la la! The Chelsea version covered three floors and on most days remained open for up to 16 hours, seven days a week. Hugely unusual then. I expect that was a no to half day closing then. The complex offered customers bars, a chemist, newsstands, record stores and other concessions. 
A popular service was the flying squad delivery. This involved young ladies clad in purple catsuits riding flashy motorcycles. God blimey! I'd love to have seen that. But at the time, the local residents were appalled by the whole darn thing and probably did the usual up in arms thing. It's blinking McDonald's now. What a come down. The 60s most definitely laid the foundations for what occurred next in the 70s and the 80s. In 1971, Let It Rock was opened by Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood at 4.30. Not 4.30 in the afternoon, 430 on the King's Road, which morphed into sex, too fast to live, too young to die, and seditionaries. This witnessed the explosion called punk, which was a lifestyle as much as based in music and clothing. The shop was renamed in the 80s World's End, and it is still owned by Vivian, from where she sells her Angomania label. However, the real longevity medal goes to Peter Jones, the department store hovering about on Slow Square. The store started in number four to six Kings Road before expanding to cover most of the block. Peter Jones actually died in 1905 and after a difficult period was bought by the never knowingly undersold mob, circa 1914. Despite its defining streamlined facade, built during the mid-1930s, featuring the first glass curtain walling in Britain, this grand design is an amalgam of five buildings constructed between 1895 and 1965. This in actual fact means lovely clean curved lines outside, but all higgledy-piggledy inside or it was until 2004, when its innards got a £107 million makeover and never losing a day's trading to do so. The leg end building, oh, can read that again? The legendary building, that is Peter Jones, is a grade two listed building. In the latter half of the 20th century, the King's Road became one of the centres for counterculture, but now it's gone all gentrified, yep, fried in gentry. It is now no more than Chelsea's High Street and one of the most fashionable shopping streets in London. It has been criticised for losing its character and having just too many high street chains. Did you know Starbucks opened its first UK branch in 1999 on the KR? Yep, in principle I think I'd agree with that. Yet another dull, boring 21st century high street. And from now on there'll be a change in me. My walk will be different. But for good or evil, this has been my K for King's Road. Oh, Foxy Lady. <laughs> Foxy Lady. 